Good morning, everybody. I'm April Gunder. This needs to be down a little. Um, happy to have you all here. We're going to do a call to worship. Um, children of God, welcome. We do that one one more time just because I didn't hear that response. Okay. Children of God, welcome. Welcome to this place. Oh. Oh. I, I don't have that. Oh, that's not the right one from today. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yikes. That makes a big difference. Shall we wait just a moment? <laughs> sometimes I have nightmares. Um, you, know, you know sometimes how you have nightmares when you're supposed to be taking a final exam somewhere and you don't know where the room is and you haven't cracked your book and all those nightmares. Sometimes I have nightmares that I come in and we're on the wrong, I'm, I can't find the page we're on. And you all are on the same page and I'm on a different one. And you know what? That was just it. <laughs> we just lived it. And this will help me the next time I have the nightmare that we can just work through this together, right? By God's grace, we'll just work through it together. Are we ready? Just keep going. Here we go. Okay. God, welcome. I will light you were doing that, right? No, no, no. You're on the next phrase now. Okay. Oh, welcome to this place of hope and pres uh, perseverance. God invites us to share the good news. In gratitude for this, let us worship God. It's 770. I'm going to eat at the table, the welcome table. Please stand in body and spirit and let us sing together.
to be seated, please. And I invite the children and the youth to join me up at the front of the church, please. And we just fill out this front pew right here. Right here, good morning. Let's just fill out this front pew with you all. Welcome, welcome. So a week ago Friday, uh, we had our first confirmation student night together here in the church. And uh, we were talking about God. We were talking about symbols for God, metaphors from scripture for God to help us understand the character and nature of God. And these were some of the centerpieces that they had at their table. And so I just, I don't know if you can see them, but I'm going to kind of walk around with them. This is one of them. There's a little candle in these hands. What do you guys think about how this represents the character of God, this symbol? What do you think? What do you think? It's good. Yeah, it's good. It's a good representation. What do you guys think? How, how, if you remember that from Friday night, you guys who were there, how does this, what, how does this remind us of God? God's holding the light. God's holding us. God's holding the church. God's holding the world. Got the whole world in his hands. All right, and this one, this one was another one. This is a gathering of people around the light. Community, right? Right, these are people's heads sticking up around this light. Remember this one? You had this one, Mackenzie. I think you talked about that one. This was another one. This is actually a labyrinth. A finger labyrinth, it looks like this, a finger labyrinth with a candle in the center. What, do you remember what this one was about? Why we talked about this one? Henry, what do you think? What do you remember? Yeah, this is a path. This is a path and the path, the way of Christ is a path with the light of God in the center. You know, so that's, that's that sense that we're on a journey, that we're on a path of life, and God's light is at the center. So we had several other things, several other symbols that were in the table. They wanted us to kind of think differently and pray differently this morning around this table. So I'm going to invite those of you who were at the confirmation um, evening in just a minute to come up. And with each phrase of this bidding prayer, you all know what a bidding prayer is? We're going to, we'll do our joys and concerns this morning as a introduction with a phrase and then if you feel moved to speak a name or an event or a circumstance into that phrase we'll have a moment for that silence so that you can speak it in that in that time so um, when when we come to that part of the prayers i'm going to invite one of the confirmation students to take a candle light from the christ candle here and light one of these candles there's going to be three sections of prayer this morning so Let's follow along. And also, if you have specific prayer requests that you would like in the weekly newsletter, there's prayer cards right in front of you in the pew rack. I invite you to write out that prayer request, drop it in the offering when it comes. Okay? So we're going to talk this morning. We're going to offer up prayers this morning as this thing called a bidding prayer. I'll speak a phrase. One of you will light a candle. And you guys, you know, how about there's four of you and there's three candles. One, two, volume, yeah, arm wrestle for it, I don't know. I love that creativity, but this morning we're going to light one candle at a time for each phrase as we're lifting up those prayers. You can light one. Mackenzie, you light one. And Harrison, you light one. Okay? All right. All right. Are you ready? Let's pray together. Loving God, you are lavish with your grace in our gratitude for all you have done for us, in our hope that you are still at work reconciling the world, in our faith that your heart contains love for every living thing we offer you our prayers, for families that are divided, for brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, mothers and fathers who live in distant lands isolated from one another for friends and for neighbors whose relationships are strained 
we pray for your healing grace to restore wholeness to that which is torn asunder as we lift each one by name lord hear our prayers For all whose wounds are deep, for the lonely and the lost, for all who struggle with addictions, for the anxious and despairing, for all who await test results or treatment options, we pray for a deep and abiding sense of your presence to bring comfort and love. As we lift each one by name, Lord, hear our prayers. I pray for Dwight. For all who are in need of guidance this day, for leaders in governmental office, in schools, in corporations, in churches and communities of care, for all who seek your wisdom, your path forward, your way of truth and justice, faith and hope, light the way, O oh God, we pray, as we lift each one by name, Lord, hear our prayers. The people of Israel and Palestine. Your kingdom come, your will be done all across the land. Your manna, your food for the hungry, may they be filled. And your food for the satisfied, may it be shared. Your forgiveness received, offered and multiplied. Your shalom in all and through all we pray. Lord, hear our prayers, amen. I'm going to invite the children to come around the table with me. Everybody, come around the table, way around the table, way around the table. Let's make a big circle around it. And if you will, let's join hands, okay? But let's do it this way. Watch me. Do it this way. Do it cross like this and, and join hands. Cross like this. Everybody in. Titus, you want to come in? Okay, now, if we move closer to the table... What can we see? I can see your faces across the, ta across the circle. I can't really see a whole lot more than your faces. We're just looking at each other right now. What if we do that? 
Now what are we looking at? Well, I'm not looking at any people. Some of you are looking out at the congregation. I'm not looking at, at you guys anymore. Let's Let's come back around together again. Well, I don't know what's going on here Harrison with you, but we're doing scripture over here. Let's do this now. Now, what happens when this happens? Leo, drop, drop the hand of your sister and, and step away from each other for a little bit. Open up, while well, you hold on to Mackenzie's hand still, open up some space, open up some space between you. All right, Olivia, drop hands with, uh, okay, and, and open up some space this way, okay, with them, okay. And you guys back up just a little bit, and um, and Harrison, you drop the hand of Andrew. Open up a little bit. Open up a little bit. Open the circle wider, 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 wider. Now we're still in a circle. We're still in a circle, but look at I can see through you to other people. We can see through each other to other people. There's open spaces to join the circle, right? So as we pray, we make room for each other when we pray. We make room for the world when we pray. We make room for the congregation when we pray. And we say together, Lord, hear our prayers. Thank you guys very much for joining in this prayer today. And uh, as you go forward to your classes, as you leave us and you go to your classes, may you learn more about welcome and prayer and forgiveness. Thank you so much for being with us. We're going to come into a time of confession, and I'm going to invite you to take a hymnal, which is in the rack right in front of you. Turn to hymn number 423. 423. And uh, we'll be singing verses one at a time, and we'll be praying around those verses. I'm going to introduce us into this prayer of confession. Then there's a moment that we'll hold in silence. Phil will decide when to break that silence. He's asked me for how long to hold it, and I've said, you know, when you're done confessing all the things that you need to confess, <laughs> and you can break it. <laughs> all right, 423, everyone have it. We're going to stay, so we're going to remain seated. New every day is God's love for us, and new every day is our opportunity to come to the Creator who loves us with the truth of our lives. Trusting in God, in God's grace and mercy, in God's desire for wholeness and healing, let us make our confession first in silent prayer. us in love, to enjoy this world and you, to serve your creation and your children. We know that we do not do your will. With clenched hands, we can neither give nor receive. With eyes shut tight, we cannot see pain or beauty. With feet of clay, we cannot dance in joy or run to help. With others at the center of everything, we cannot create true community. Give us the courage and strength to change. 
Open our hands and eyes, move our feet, decenter us and turn us toward grace and hope and trust in you. This good news is for us all. Christ's love knows no boundaries, and our sin is but a grain of sand in the ocean of God's grace. Know that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to find hymn number 582 in your hymnal, 582, and let's stand and sing together. 582. Let's stand. another with the peace of Christ. workshop a long time ago and uh, we we're talking about what uh, what we were yearning for in the church and I said one of the things I yearn for in the church is joy <laughs> and um, the person one of the people at my table said do you mean Presbyterian joy <laughs> and I and I you know I get I get a little of that sometimes when we try to sing a spiritual and um, and we're not sure what the tune is and we're kind of concentrating on the tune and we got these looks on our faces like we're singing Glory to God, whose goodness shines on me. <laughs> I'm wondering, that's not Presbyterian joy, is it? I, I, yeah, I think, I think not. Um, I just love the laughter. I love. Thank you for the, the 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 tambourine. I love that. I love the little bit of clapping. I just love the the really trying to express what it means to to let that out. Uh, glory to God, whose goodness shines on me. Grateful to be with you this morning with all of you. So uh, in just a moment, April and I will be bringing us the scripture reading this morning, and you all will have uh, a response as well. Um, we are bridging two stories of families this morning from the scriptures. Families of, uh, with brothers in distant lands and famines and confessions and forgiveness. One of them is from Genesis. It's the story of Jacob's family. And the other is this parable from the 15th chapter of Luke that we've been exploring for the last three weeks. I invite you to note the similarities and the contrasts as we weave these stories together. I'll read the Genesis text, and you will join your voices with April's in the Luke text. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him an ornamented robe. Quickly, bring out the robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. 
When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. He became angry and refused to go in. Listen, for all these years, I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you had never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, that ornamented robe that he wore. And they took him and they threw him into a pit. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him up out of the pit, and they sold him to Ishmaelites who took Joseph to Egypt. The younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant region. Joseph went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven plenteous years the earth produced abundantly, he gathered up all the food of the seven years where there was plenty in the land of Egypt and stored up food in the cities. Joseph stored up grain in such abundance, like the sand of the sea, that he stopped measuring it. It was beyond measure. And there he squandered his health in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the region and he began to be in need. Seven years of famine began to come. There was famine in every country, but throughout the land of Egypt there was bread. All the world came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine became severe throughout the world. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that region who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. Jacob said to his sons, there's grain in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer and he said, I'm your brother, Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there so that you and your household and all that you have will not come into poverty. The father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet his father Israel. He presented himself to him, fell on his neck, and wept on his neck a good while. Israel said to Joseph, I can die now, having seen for myself you are still alive. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave us this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And then his brothers also wept fell down before him and said, we are here as your slaves. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he's doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. You are always with me. All that I have is yours. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Today we consider forgiveness in a long story arc. The hurts and the offenses of our past, sometimes it's long ago past, often color our relationships throughout our whole lives. And not only our lives, our children, our children's children, the generations and the future. William Shakespeare said the sins of the father are to be laid on the children. Jesus teaches that the grace of the father is for all the children. Episcopalian priest William Countryman says the past can be a burden or a weapon or it can be building material for the future, for ourselves and others. Forgiveness is the means by which we partake in God's great project of redeeming the past and creating from it the life of the ages to come, he says. You remember that, that well-known Charles Dickens story, A Christmas Carol? You woke up this morning and were ever closer to the season of that story. Ebenezer Scrooge is visited by four ghosts. The first is his old business partner, Jacob Marley. He's rattling around in the afterlife, burdened by a long and heavy chain. You are fettered, a trembling Scrooge says to him. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, Marley says. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it of my own free will and of my own free will, I wore it. Scrooge wears a similar chain, although his, like ours, is invisible, forged link by link from grudges and personal slights Bitterness, jealousy, betrayals, things that make the heart grow smaller and smaller and the chain longer, longer, heavier and heavier. Jacob Marley hopes to warn Scrooge while he still has time to break the chain and change his life. And then three more ghosts join in that effort to visit Ebenezer Scrooge over the next three nights. The ghost of Christmas past reveals painful scenes of old wounds, of a lonely childhood, a cold and loveless father, a fiance who broke their engagement. The ghost of Christmas present shows him this jolly family Christmas to which he was not invited. And then there's the sick child, Tiny Tim, whose family doesn't have the resources, unlike Scrooge, to make him well. The final ghost to visit is Christmas yet to come. If the trajectory of Ebenezer Scrooge's life continues on its track, it leads to a death no one grieves. The result of a long arc of bitterness and loneliness made link by link of his own free will. Rejection begets rejection, wounds generate more wounds until this miserly man with a shriveled heart comes to a sad and tragic end. But the good news for Ebenezer Scrooge is that it's a dream. He can wake up, he can become a Christmas miracle. He can break the chain and he can let his life be a blessing for his family, for Tiny Tim and for the whole community. Imagine the ripple effects for generations to come. For the last three weeks, we've been engaged with this exploration of forgiveness through the story of the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, the parable that we know as the prodigal son, story of a father and two brothers. It's told by Jesus. Both, both brothers have dishonored their father who offers them both 
unconditional love and an invitation to receive his grace and be a blessing to their family and to the entire village. And you remember there's a party at the end of that story. This party is intended to be a celebration of homecoming. And we wonder at the end of the story, will both brothers come home? Really come home? Not just for the party, but for the enduring potential of life together in the family, in the village, over the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years. What will their words and actions teach their children, their children's children, about family, forgiveness, honor, responsibility, generosity, and love? And there's this other much older story that we saddled up side by side with this parable this morning. It's also a tale of sibling rivalry, a fractured family, life in a distant land, devastating famine, and a family reunion. And that story offers us a much larger arc from which to explore. And in fact, it is the largest contiguous story in the whole Bible. It takes up over 25% of the book of Genesis. In this story, the young brother Joseph also left his family, although not by his choice. His jealous brothers beat him up, threw him in a pit, and sold him into slavery. But he grew up all those years into adulthood in a faraway land. And through a variety of events and circumstances, his reputation there grew. He worked hard, he earned trust, and he became one of the most influential people of that land. By Joseph's wise counsel, when the time was full of grain, when the earth was producing plentifully, they stored that grain for some time in the future when it would be scarce. And indeed, a famine struck that land. They were ready with more than enough to feed the whole land and spare. Joseph's wisdom and prudence fed that nation and more. And then when his family, when his family, the very brothers who hurt him begged for bread, he fed them too. The end of the Joseph story sounds a lot like the homecoming of the prodigal son. His brothers still wear the chains they forged link by link yard by yard of guilt for the way they treated him all those years ago. And so they come to him weeping and begging for his forgiveness. They fall before him seeking to be treated as his slaves. That's all they believe they can ever be. And Joseph embraces them as his brothers, promising to care for not only them, but their children and their children's children. Why doesn't Joseph hold a grudge? Why doesn't he seek revenge? Why doesn't he make his brothers pay for what they did to him? Why doesn't he settle, make them settle the debts they owe him, that whole lifetime away from his family, from his father? How oh, their terrible deceit to that beloved father. Why doesn't he react like the older brother in the parable of Jesus, resentful over what should have been stolen and never was? Even though you intended to harm me, God intended it for good, Joseph said. See, that's how he understands his life, a life lived by God's grace that he is blessed to be a blessing no matter the circumstances, whether it's a prison or a palace or anywhere in between. He is God's life. His is God's life. It's in God's hands, purposed for God's work. Isn't that really finally what breaks the chain? We are where we are, wherever that is, however we got here, to be a blessing, to be a light for the world to spread kindness, to be a beacon of hope. We don't exist unto ourselves. We are created in love for love, set free to live a life of freedom. We are forgiven to forgive. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link, yard by yard. I girded it of my own free will. And of my own free will, I wore it 
we all wear them. Invisible chains that we have forged through our lives, link by link, by our own wills, we've made them, and we have wrapped them securely around ourselves. And by our own free will, we wear them. And we have the free will to recognize the impact that has on us, on our children, on our friendships, our jobs, our communities. We have the free will to live into God's grace and break it, that chain. Next week is the first Sunday of Advent, and I don't know if you have ever done this with your children or with your grandchildren or with other people's children. Make, make, children make an Advent chain of construction paper strips. You cut them in strips, the construction paper, and then you make them into a, a link, and then you, you, know, you twist it around another link, and then you make this big chain. And sometimes people will write a blessing on each one, or they'll write an activity, a, like a little random act of kindness on each one that you can do together as a family for a neighbor. Maybe you write a prayer, a scripture verse, and you make this big long chain that you break one, you open one up each day on the countdown to Christmas. You ever done that? You know what I'm talking about? What about doing something like that as an exercise, a practice of reviewing the circumstances in our lives? The words we still hang on to, the past offenses or hurts, the events that have altered the trajectory of our lives, one by one, writing out each strip, each story, each event, each circumstance, each phrase, each word, link by link, links we forged over the decades of our lives. And then what if we create this chain and, and maybe even wrap it around ourselves if it's long enough, but every day then what if we were to break one open and read it and sit with it and pray over it and offer a blessing to it? What if we reflected on the potential learning that was in it and the grace to receive it? Maybe even the way God used that thing for good in our lives, or the lives of others? And then if we, what if we pray for the freedom to let that go, to lean more fully into the new life that God stretches out before us, into the light and the love that God has for us, into the welcome home, into the joy, not just Presbyterian joy, but joy that God stretches out before us. Imagine the ripple effects a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now, of the new Scrooge, and I'm talking now about the one who woke up on that brand new Christmas morning after the last visit, who broke the chains that bound him and began a new life that day. It was said of him, he was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend as good a master, as good a man, as good a, a good as good a human being as the good old city knew or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Beloved brothers and sisters, that's the miracle that God yearns to do in each and every one of us. May it be so. Our life is an offering. Our life is an offering to the one who is the giver of all good things. And when we offer an opportunity for people to give in the collection, in the offering of the morning service on Sunday mornings, it is an invitation to give a symbol, a portion of the gift of our lives. Whether it's something we've made with our hands, whether it's resources from the work of our lives, this is an opportunity to give back to the one who has given us all that we are. The choir will gather together also and offer a song. And if you did bring your pledge cards this morning, we are dedicating our 2023 pledges 
this morning as well. So go ahead and drop those in the offering as well, please. In the pledge booklet that went out, there was a quote from the pastor who preached a centennial sermon in 1928. That was the year my mother and father were both born. So, so many years ago, 1928. And in that sermon, that pastor said, build a future that is suitable. The church you receive as a legacy, build a suitable future. And boy, we talked at the session retreat yesterday. Did that pastor have any idea what that future would look like. No, we never do. But that is the stewardship challenge. That is the challenge for all of us. How do we build a suitable future of faith and hope and light and love right here in this beautiful legacy in which we sit? Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we dedicate these pledges to you, these faithful instruments of our love and trust in you to lead us into an unknown future that we may be indeed suitable as a messenger of your hope, your life, your light, your grace. Next year, in two years, in five years, in 10, 20, 50, 100 years from now, a beacon of hope on the boulevard. Receive these gifts, we pray, and guide us, we pray, and open our hearts to your will, we pray. Amen.
Our final hymn is 774. 774. It's called There Is Now a New Creation, and I invite you to stand in body or spirit and sing together. of announcements before I offer the charge and the benediction. As uh, Phil offers the postlude, I do invite you to take the pad of, uh, it's actually maybe a friendship pad at the end of the pew. It's on the end here and on the end here. And, and we do uh, love to know that you have been with us. So if you would write your name and if you're new with us, if you'd write your address, a way we can contact you and say thank you for being with us. Pass it all the way down. So across the aisle on the sides, all the way down and then all the way back. And Take note of the people who are sitting next to you, the names of the people who are with you. Uh, we have started confirmation class. I mentioned that there are seven young people between the ages of 12 and 15 in that class. Each of them is asked to find a mentor, a member of the congregation who will mentor them in this journey. Some of them don't know a lot of people, but they will be asking. And if you are interested and willing to be someone's mentor. It's their choice, so I'm not making any promises. But if you are interested and willing, please let me know, because I'm asked to help sometimes with pairing people. So I would like to know if you're open to that, if your heart is open to being a mentor to a young person in confirmation. We are going forward from this place. We are going forward from this theme. We've been studying the theme of forgiveness. We're moving into another one next Sunday as we begin Advent together. But I pray that we will not forget to practice forgiveness for one another, for ourselves, for all who God places in our path. So let's go forward as God's forgiving people, passing the peace, making sure that no one misses the peace of Christ. May we, do, may we do so in the love of God the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.